The inception of the band was an assembly of the best musicians I could find in the city of Chicago. We actually discussed about making the best band we could possibly make, that the band would be a musical democracy. And I said, when you give me your hand, that'll be the contract. And the only way you get out of it is to ask out or you die. I've always thought of Chicago in terms of a family rather than eras. You know, in the span of 40 or 50 years, there are going to be changes, and I don't care if it's a family or a band, it, there are going to be changes. The realization becomes, you know, we're all replaceable. We're all replaceable. Our first pictures were in a foundation of a building, and we had suits, and we, you know, we picked up shovels. We were, like, leaning on shovels and stuff. I enjoyed playing music. I enjoyed playing in all the groups that I had played in up to then, which were like three or four different combinations. But I really enjoyed playing with these guys. You know, it was a whole other animal. Robert has always been a songwriter ever since I met him. When uh, he joined the band, he had a book of 50 songs. I remember meeting him at DePaul and he had a notebook this thick full of lyrics. And I just remember, he said, well, I've got a few songs here. And I just said, well, you know, they might come in handy one day. In those days, there weren't bands that, you know, there were singers, individual singers, and the bands backed up the singers. While we were playing in the clubs, we were doing what other, other bands do. We were playing covers. The club owners wanted us to play stuff that people could dance to and then drink and they would make money and, you know, hopefully fill the club. We started playing one song called Clouds and we got fired because we did an original song and he wanted to hear Top 40. But it was exciting because really we had gotten a chance to really hear what the band sound like. You know, we wore the suits and we did the steps. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Club GZ. We're going to warm it up with a couple belly rubbers. It was an entirely different uh, attitude towards playing music and then eventually we began to arrange those songs for the instrumentation of chicago and that's when we got into some dispute we'd get a call on a saturday night at like nine o'clock saying saying this goddamn band chicago transit authority they won't play the top 40 shit the kids hate it we're, we're gonna we're, we're getting rid of them after the next break can you guys come down and finish the night And there'd be the boys packing up their stuff, you know, and they're pissed. And, and we're thinking to ourselves, why don't they just lighten up? Why don't they just play the, you know, you know, give them a little Rolling Stones, give them a little, you know, Temptations if they want, want it, whatever. But we're thinking, eh, you know, they got to go their own way. Terry came on stage at Barnaby's on State Street in Chicago. And I think it was during the first tune, he just ripped the shirt, the, the coat right off of his back. And that was it. We went straight to hippiedom. Then we started doing original material, and there was a, it was a small group of people that dug it. Kind of the legend around Illinois was that Chicago Transit Authority had been formed out of these local supergroups. You know, as we watched them play, we were all like, wow, these guys can really read music. <laughs> these guys really know what they're doing. Playing in a band with horns was with used guys was extraordinary, but but uh, but Terry Kath's talent was just amazing. Terry and I hung out a lot together. Terry's the kind of guy that made up his own vocabulary and his own context. And also the way that Danny played drums. Danny, he had a feel, an R&B back thing. I mean, wow. Terry, Walt, and myself were a band of brothers. We were, we were inseparable, really. We were really, really close. And had already been through a lot together. But Peter, he was a great, great singer. I mean, I, when I first heard his voice, I made, oh, wow. 
Peter Satira had been in another band called The Exceptions. That's my earliest recollection of knowing anything about Chicago. Our first gig uh, was at the Club Gigi, uh, an upholstered sewer on the south side of Chicago. The only people in the audience were my parents. I mean, it was just, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, this is great. Something happened in me that I decided that this is what I wanted to do for a living. As soon as I came to that realization, my my mom and dad tried to talk me out of it because they didn't think there was any uh, any future, you know, long-term future anyway. We're often asked in school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, uh, I don't fireman. Uh, all the while, we were in contact with Jim Gersio. I first became involved with the fellows in Chicago in, uh, in college. Gersio really saw that there was no way for this to be successful unless there was total commitment. He had an idea of building a management company, and he called it his creative community. I think that his business tactics definitely had a hand in our creation and our success. He envisioned everything sort of being under one roof. And when the time was right, we brought them to Los Angeles. The stars were aligned. We were supposed to do this. We were just meant to be. We all lived in a little house under the Hollywood freeway. And our bedrooms were various rooms. My bedroom was the dining room. Each guy had a shelf in the medicine cabinet. Each guy had a shelf in the refrigerator. God forbid you take somebody's food. There were a lot of referees. Whoever had to take the last shower got the cold shower. So you, you drew straws every day you went to work. The home front. We went from clubs to we moved to LA and more and more people, you know, starting to, to become aware of the band and, and realizing that we were starting to become successful. My dad always told me, dream a big dream. If you, if you shoot for the moon and hit a star, it's cool. When you put it all on the line, there's a certain intensity and focus, and we had that. We were uh, very confident and uh, energetic kids. We liked what we did, and we saw that other people liked what we did, but we, we didn't know if we were gonna have more than two records. straight out of playing, you know, bars in Chicago, and we had moved out to Southern California, and here we ran into Janis Joplin at the Fillmore West. She came in with this big entourage, and she dropped her brush right at my feet, and she went, hey, mf -er. Pick up the effing brush. And I says, pick up your own brush. And when you get done with that, after you pick it up, apologize to me that you talked to me that way. Well, she picked up the brush and she said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and that was the start of a thing where she hung with us and she showed us what she did at the command on the stage. Well, you know you got it. of how she could really handle people. And we were on the tour, the last big tour on the West Coast. That was the last tour that Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin did. We saw their last show. We played every peace rally that ever happened in California, I think, and we didn't have any money. So they started riding like crazy, and we started doing anything we could to pay the rent. We just happened to play the Whiskey of Gogo, and Jimmy had a camera and took some pictures of Chicago Transit at CTA on the on the marquee at the Whiskey, which when I go by there, I always think of Jimmy and I standing in the middle of Sunset Boulevard going. I remember we were, I think, uh, opening for B.B. King or something like that, um, and uh, or Albert King. Walter turned around to walk out. He probably, he might have told you this story. I got a tap on my shoulder. And I turn around, I was putting my, one of my saxophones away. It was Jimi Hendrix. He called me by name and he said, Walt, 
the horns are like one set of lungs. Your guitar player is better than me. A horn section that sounds like one set of lungs and a guitar player that's better than me. He said that uh, Terry plays better than him. <laughs> First, you have to realize we were already listening intensely to his music. We, you know, we looked up to him. Terry was already playing stuff that Hendrix had on his records. Terry could play uh, a rhythm guitar part, a lead guitar part, and sing a lead vocal simultaneously. I've never heard anybody that can do that. And I gotta tell you, I think in a couple weeks we're on the road with Hendrix. You got to see some of the stuff that was uh, uh, driving them because Jimmy wasn't happy with the licks he was playing. Do you have to practice every day the way a violinist does? I mean, if you're not working, say you're off in England and you're just taking well, I, off I like a couple to, months, um, do you have to keep shape every day? Yeah, well, I like to like, play to myself and like in the, in the room or before we go on stage or something like this or whenever I feel like you know, whenever I feel down or depressed or whatever you know you know stuff that happens to every musician and you know especially guys who are in the limelight and, and are put on pedestals and you know and, and they they have that pressure of having to do something new all the time we were on a plane and I said why are you so unhappy about what you're doing and he says, well, you're going to know this one day, and you're going to probably know it more than me. You're going to be real successful. You're going to have to spit up hits. You're going to have to work real hard. You know, that's really not what I'm into. I says, I'd love to have your problems, you know? And, and he said, well, you will have them. to New York to make a deal and to get them signed to Columbia Records. I first heard about Chicago from David Geffen, and he said, I keep hearing about a group that Jimmy Garcia has been working with called Chicago Transit Authority. we had given him a right of first refusal deal so that he really could not sign an artist to another label until he gave us the right of first refusal. I signed them and was very happy. <laughs> four-sided album, almost an hour and a half of new music that we performed very well and, and with enthusiasm and with a lot of joy. And material that they themselves created and wrote, they did it with their material, they did it combining jazz, pop, and rock in clearly a very, very uh, special way. My instinct is to always be different, and time, you know, the concept of time is, is really abstract. It can take you anywhere, you know, from the future to history to right now. But my own perception of myself based on how I think when I'm writing, I mean, to this day, is to try to do something I haven't done before. And I could take things much further, but I try to try to keep it in the context of, you know, w w what's listenable. It is. It was the first thing we ever recorded as a band together. That's right. Well, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the first thing we ever did. Yeah. And it was it was sort of frightening because we all got in the same recording studio and we sort of were in a sort of a circle. And for myself personally, and I think maybe Lee and Jimmy, we didn't want to look at each other because we were afraid if we looked at one of the other guys, we'd make we'd make them make a mistake. As I was 
Once you know, we got into the studio, we <laughs> we started thinking we might not be ready because we had no idea that when this little microphone gets in front of you, it hears everything. This is going to be forever. Da 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 da. You go. I was kind of doing the Beatles. You know, I can sing in many styles, but my style, at least when I was rendering that song, was not to sing it like John Lennon, but was just, just, just to sing it straight. You know, in those days, you were, it was a 16 track. Producers really did their work in those days. They were really, they made decisions on the spot. And Peter's bass and my kick drum were on the same track. I mean, I never knew that. I wrote beginnings based on scribbled notes I had that I've been carrying around forever. I just love the idea of strumming 16th note figures and kind of a really present vocal. Right away, the song had some kind of resonance and some kind of appeal. You know, because basically, songs need to be memorable. So I showed Terry what I was doing on guitar, and he was a piece of cake for him. We were all still very young. We are all still very wide-eyed and without experience. Jimmy always said it. I always believed that we would have do what we would do. And when the first album hit the charts at, I think, 42 or something like that, with a bullet or whatever, I went, that's cool. And then all of a sudden we realized we were more of an album act and they weren't getting what, what horns were. You know, people had come up to the horns and go, well, how do you, where, where's the strings? How do you tune it with the strings? I said, there aren't strings on the saxophone, the reeds, and, and they didn't really know about horns. It was really the, the start inception of horn bands. Walt was the eternal optimist. We were on our way to a gig and I don't know, I somehow I associated, uh, hey Walt, do you think I'll ever have a cashmere suit? You know, cashmere suit? I still don't have a cashmere suit. I don't know what, what I associated that with, but, and Walt just looked at me and you kidding? You'll have 200 of them. This was a concept that he totally believed in and had no doubt that it was gonna, you know, it was gonna develop into something significant. I will say one thing that I got that I remember, and I remember Jimmy told me, and I forgot this. We were in Indianapolis with, with Hendrix, 20,000 people there, and they're yelling, bring on Hendrix, bring on Hendrix. I got so fed up, I got on the mic and said, shut the bleep up and listen. AM radio was still a baby. Uh, you know, it, it was top 40, but it was bubblegum stuff. They weren't ready for what we were doing. FM radio was commercial free in those days and played whole albums. And AM radio still hadn't played one of our songs. We released Beginnings, we released Does Anybody Really Know What Time It Is? And they wouldn't play it because they said we hadn't had a hit. You know, catch 22. How the hell are you going to have a hit if you don't play something? There was a certain amount of frustration because of the singles that had been released and weren't successful. Besides the fact that we were doing a fair amount of drugs and partying and being young musicians on the road, and young musicians will burn the candle. The zeitgeist of that era was that people our age were noticing that we felt different about things. And we sort of felt like we ought to try to do something about it. We're watching the war in Vietnam on television. We're watching the marches in the South for voter registration. We're watching all this stuff and we're reading about it and we feel like you know, we need to, we need to have our voices heard.
So it gave our, our music a political flavor and uh, college uh, students grabbed this because, man, these guys are spreading the word, you know? These guys are hip, they're with us, you know? And we became kind of the required listening, you know, on college campuses. If you were hip, you had to listen to Chicago Transit Authority because these guys know the score. And uh, next thing you know, let's stand up, you know, to to the, uh, the powers that be, you know. Let's riot in the streets. Let's tear the system down. But we didn't want to go that route. We're not politicians, we're musicians. wasn't time to really think about too much. We were on the road 250 days, I think, and we had all, all we could do just to keep our sanity. We would come home for a day and leave for three months <laughs> and be out there working every night. We were working so intensely. We were traveling so intensely. We were learning and rehearsing the songs of the second album while we were on tour promoting the first album. When the second album came out, Jimmy had written ballet for, for a girl in McCannon and AM radio said that they were interested in Make Me Smile. And I'm in the car and I hear this. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm going, oh, hey, that's the ballet. And I was going, I'm, I'm in the car going, hey, hey, this is this is me on the radio. You know, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I the disc jockey came on, said, here's a a new song by an up-and-coming group called Chicago that's destined for number one or something like that. And ba -ba -ba -ba. This is cool, you know? They're gonna play the ballet on the radio. Boy, I, I, how can they play something that long? At that time, AM radio, the jungle warfare of music. AM radio, you know. I think if you had a cut longer than three and a half minutes, you would not really get it on top 40 radio. And they took the end of the ballet, which was the reprise of Make Me Smile, and spliced it onto the first movement, which was the beginning of Make Me Smile, and made it the whole song by itself. Fortunately, the issue was resolved because the album would have the longer original version on there. I would be reconstructing actual history if I tried to ascertain whether or not the group was reluctant to be in the spotlight. They were performing artists from the very get-go. Their material was very strong. Other than experiencing the joy of playing music, I didn't really think of anything in terms of success or longevity or that was way, way down the road. So hard to be to only you People staring at me Try to take you away There's no time to delay We've got to live for today The ballet was not an easy piece to perform live. So much to say. Because there are time changes, there are key changes, a lot of different intricacies that had to be fit together like a puzzle. 
This guy's singing that, this guy's singing this. And we were playing with these world-class singers, players, writers, and Lee, the same thing. Lee was a really serious musician. But it also he had real he had a real identity problem at the, in those days. I mean, it was real tough. I never had confidence in myself. I was always like, I'm not good enough. I don't know. I you know, I don't belong here. I was just afraid of people, afraid of success, I guess. I wasn't writing a pop song. These movements in the ballet were titled in the Latin for tempo or mood. It was just a series of classical moments sewn together, and Color My World was kind of a break. Andante, cantabile. One thing that differs with my songs, when I wrote a song, not being a lead vocalist, it was a sing-off. I didn't have to have a sing-off on that. That was Ray Charles, that was Terry Cat. I got a phone call and it was Jimmy Panko. He says, you know, I got an idea for a movement of the ballet. Okay, let's slow it down and get a little... Oh, let's get pretty. Simple, brief, a little romantic interlude between Make Me Smile and uh, Agitato. Dun, 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 which was another, you know. Quizzically, he looked at me out of the corner of his eye and he went, I said, well, what, what do you think? I looked at him and honestly, I said, it'll make me famous. What a player and an arranger, you know, it was a really great to have a guy that great in your band. I had that gift, but you have to learn the instrument well enough to reproduce that tape that's going on in your head. Beside the brass arrangements, his sense of melody, his expression in his playing his horn, it's just, it's just uncanny. Make Me Smile was actually titled Vivace. It's the first movement and then it reprises at the end. Lennon, they said, how would you like to be remembered? I remember John Lennon said, just as a good little rock and roll band. You know, we want to be just a good little rock and roll band with horns. You know, Rockstar had nothing to do with it at all. It was about art and it was about making our music. I think it was more of a brand in those days, the logo. It is a brand. Not more or less, it just is. You know, like Coca-Cola is a brand. I never really thought about us being thought of as a product. But if you think about the logo, I really always just thought it was, you know, if they saw Chicago, they knew the band. I think the pop music business is a business that happens to sell art occasionally. But it is certainly not a business where everything, all the product is art. I think it is a corrupt business. I think it is archaic and antiquated. And it is probably the most exceptionally dishonest industry. I mean, maybe I have never, I haven't been involved in munitions or anything, but I know that the record business is is, is quite dishonest because of the nature of the investment. You see, a very small investment of a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars can return hundreds of thousands of times its initial investment. Becoming famous, whatever that is, and I still don't know, you know, get, get, I get a, inklings of it and everything, is something that was not personally, you'll probably get a different answer from, from every one of the originals. It scared me. And I, I think it scared us to a point that we could have gone one of two ways. Somebody could have gone, ah, I don't need these guys, I'm gonna do my own stuff, or this. And 
you know, or, or just go, let's just, we've taken care of ourselves this far. We got through it with club owners. We lost gigs because of playing our own material because we believed in it. Let's just hang together and forget all this outside stuff. And that's what we did. The success with Chicago was truly phenomenal. Make me smile and color my world in 25 or six to four. We only knew sold out arenas. So we only knew success. We didn't know. We didn't know failure and we didn't know struggle. And we were so busy that we, we didn't have time to sit down and say, We've done it. And in the meantime, we were drinking. You know, I was drinking all the time, so. Why not? Let's do that, you know. <laughs> Dumb kids thinking, you know, indestructible. You know, live forever. When I wrote 25 or 64, I was sitting in a room up above where uh, the Whiskey of Go-Go is on Sunset Strip. I just kind of found that riff I mean, waiting for the break of day. Waiting for the break of day. Searching for something to say. Searching for something to say. When I had nothing to say, I made, I made the song about writing that song. Twenty-five or six to four indicates the time in the morning. Twenty-five minutes to four a.m. So I was seeing all of that, just really describing the whole setting. I usually mean exactly what I say, except when I don't. They might not be the most perceptive human beings in terms of what they see and how they see it. But they do experience more of the common denominator of this country and of every country because of travel, just because of the nature of travel. Let's put it this way. This was before we recorded an album. And we went to New York. And we went, we used to go, you know, because everybody wanted to, you know, meet some chicks, you know, have a nice little drink and all this stuff. So, like, we'd go into these uh, nightclubs or something, you know. And, like, uh... All these groupie chicks, you know, they come up. Oh, you got long hair. Who are you? Oh, yeah, I'm with uh, CTA. <laughs> They'd split, you know, you wouldn't even see them for the rest of the night. <laughs> and now, you know, now we're in CTA, we have an album out, you know, now it's a different story, you know. We go into places, we don't even want to meet chicks half the time, chicks are like, oh, oh, oh. There was no internet, nobody looking over your shoulder. Because you could get away with so much, you did get away with so much. We traveled exclusively by charter jets. We had a Falcon jet, and it was two guys. We were flying to the next gig. We had pilots that were fresh off an aircraft carrier, flying F-16s. Mm -hmm. 
The pilots were Vietnam cats. I can't mention their names, but you know, a couple of times they smoked pot with us, and not before the flight. Uh, I don't know. These guys were right out of the military, and they wanted to part. We asked them if they could do a, you know, a roll, you know, and you know they they looked at each other and went. Are you sure you guys want to do that? They have contests, you know, the first seater and the second seater. They try to outdo each other when they, and do tricks. So they said, well, you know, we're, we're pretty much out of the mainstream. You, want, you guys still want to try to do that? Yeah! I mean, we'd be doing loops, snap rolls. Hey guys, look out the window. And all of a sudden we'd look out the window and it was like... You could look out and you see the earth turning. He had no sensation of, oh, what? <laughs> you could actually take a, a cup with liquid in it and pull the cup out from underneath and the the volume of liquid stays solid in the same shape as the, as the cup. And my, the, the balls of beer, and here comes Terry horizontally floating by me <laughs> and he's moaning and he's going to get to drink. <laughs> it, was, it was so much fun. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, we stopped with the tricks until we got to helicopters. The biggest mistake we made as a unit was this. We're all men, we know, we know our limits. That's that, that bullshit, you know? We're all men, we know our limits. That's fucking bullshit. I am optimistic by the way that things are going. Who will never ever think of it at all? Gonna make you worry when you see what's going down. Hey, tell him my business. Hey, no business at all. Terry, he was an avid shootist and he collected guns. This is a guy who could hunt, he could shoot, he could fish, he could he could ride a motorcycle, he could drive a car fast. He would come over and uh, had a couple guns that he'd bring into the house and I said, you can have a drink, but you gotta put the guns away or whatever. I said drugs and, and guns, you know, they don't mix. When you try to change things, use the power that you have. You know, I'm really worried about you, Terry. We're really, well, don't worry, I'm gonna be okay, I'm gonna be okay, you guys know me. Jimmy's creative community, he always envisioned a recording studio as a place, a destination where you could go and 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 set your stuff up, get sounds, start recording, and do it whenever you wanted. At that time, Columbia, I was forced to use their studios and they were all union. I wanted to be free creatively from any technical constraints. He envisioned having a place somewhere where you could not be bothered by the outside world. It was a great concept, actually. I think that was the devil's playground myself. Our original producer built a ranch with the money that we made him. We had huge success with Chicago. I built the studio. It's, it's the process I wanted. It's how I wanted people to conform to my environment and not theirs. I think that he was hoping in creating a place where we could go and create that it, it would become sort of a cottage industry. And there was a lot of uh, resistance. I mean, even <laughs> a lot of the guys in Chicago, what are you, nuts? That was literally a, away from everything. That was like a town within itself. I remember leaving the ranch because I needed to get some carbon monoxide. <laughs> and, you know, it was very cloistered in a way, and I just would go to Boulder and then come back. I think that when you put young guys with too much money together in a 
in an isolated venue like Caribou Ranch, it's a recipe for disaster, and it was. There are no police, <laughs> number one. We were growing beards. I remember trying to be older and tougher looking. We were carrying around these Winchesters, you know, feeling like we're in the Old West or something. happened to be uh, very close to a college town. There's a ton of drugs. There are really good drugs. The bank is there to be able to afford whatever you want delivered to your cabin in the mountains. And I was flying women up. I was Playboy bunnies. And I was, you know, had we been straight, we would have, it would have been so much better. But there was a lot of drugs, a lot. Whether it was pot or speed or coke or acid or whatever, it was all available. And it was all could be delivered. And you could use it whenever and wherever you wanted to. Could never happen now. I mean, there'd be some TMZ guy in a tree <laughs> taking a shot, taking a movie. Look what they're doing now, these guys. It was sort of like, uh, you know, a binge. It was a, 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 a ready made binge. We don't have the problems and the hassles and the headaches of getting to the studio in the middle of rush hour traffic. Nature is totally conducive to being creative. You go up to the mountains in Colorado and uh, you immerse yourself in this creative process and the real world kind of fades away. My fiance and I, we had an, uh, a problem. I can't even remember what it was about. She wound up locking herself in a bathroom and I was on the other side of the door trying to come out of the room. Oh, I don't want to see you anymore. She was not cooperating. Finally, I went, enough of this. I went through the door and it freaked her out to the point where it freaked me out when I saw her. And uh, I stopped in my tracks and I asked myself, what the hell are you doing, man? I stepped back and looked down the hallway and saw my piano. Something moved me to go to the piano. I had a tape recorder sitting on the piano. I pressed record, sat down, and this song just came out. Just You and Me began to come out of my fingers pretty much in its entirety. I don't know what power came over me because it's never happened before or since where I, where I sat at a piano and a complete song happened. I turned the machine off and I sat there in amazement wondering what had just happened. And I took this tape recorder to the bathroom where she was still sitting on the edge of the tub upset. And I played this song. It erased all the acrimony. The song just bathed it away and everything was fine. You are my love and my life. You are my inspiration. 
I took this tape up to Caribou Ranch to see if the guys are into it. And I asked him if it was any good. And Robert looked at me and said, any good? Jimmy, that's a hit song. I mean, we basically recorded albums every year. So at some point during the touring year, we would take our breaks and go to Caribou and supposedly do work. There was a lot of fucking around. I was in the midst of my first divorce. When I met her, the infatuation was there. We really had a great time together. Then we started going on the road. We were never home again. Our relationship could not handle that constantly being gone. We, I mean, by the time I came home and saw her, she didn't know me, I didn't know her. I've always been amazed when people tell me they can have relationships with their ex-wives. I don't know how they can pull that off, but a lot of people do. This is our retreat. I mean, we, we sort of rediscovered ourselves here. It's, uh, it's definitely like, it's like a monastery when you're up here. Uh, you, the, only reason, the only reason you're here... <laughs> It's a, cre it's a creative monastery. More and more songs were being played on the radio and becoming hits. We were just working constantly. It never stopped, and we had very little time to slow down and think about anything. Okay, thank you. And now, Robert Lamb and the Chicago Rhythmers step into the spotlight. You know, we couldn't do no wrong. We were at the top of our game. Without a doubt, there was a certain air of being indestructible. We lived the rock and roll life, but it had dangers. I mean, you didn't have to worry about every word came out of your mouth, or you could let it fly. I'm not sure why the greatest hits came out then, but I think there might have been uh, uh, trouble in paradise as far as the management's perception of, of us beginning to need to coast a bit because of the partying and because of the fatigue and because of... The mindset is, once we made the switch to hit singles, hit records, it's like a heroin addict, you gotta have another fix. but there was one there was one occurring and we we were beginning to pay the price management would never hold back on reminding us that well, this could be a last hit you never know when it's going to end We are the epitome of a band. I mean, it has always been a team effort. When, uh, when it starts getting weird or uh, uh, somebody always steps up to take whatever slack is going on in the career, they step up and add a little more to it and uh, we survive it somehow. Cetera kind of felt less than because he wasn't a songwriter and he wasn't really an instrumentalist. He played great bass, and he was a great singer, but he felt really insecure about presenting his songs. Here are three members from Chicago. There's Terry, and there's Peter, and there's Danny. Welcome to the UK. Can I start off with you, Terry? Sure. Where, did you where did you get the song from? Well, you gotta start with him, because he wrote this song. 
Well, I want you to say that so I could get to him, you sure, see. Good to him. Peter. Well, actually, you should know. I did write the song, just from experience. Oh, I mean, some, somebody wandered out of your life. Love. Many times. Oh. I don't know. I just oh. wrote it. I don't know. Put me on the spot like this. I have no <laughs> idea. So when Peter presented the ballad, it was like, of course, you know, we're what one of the things that Chicago was about was let's let's record and write whatever we want, including songs that not maybe not everybody in the band loves, but hey, if you write a song, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it the best we possibly can do it, because that's who we are. And because we know that that's not who we are. And we know that as as nice a song as it is, it's just not it's you know, nobody's gonna like it. perception from radio or the public or critics is that we think a certain way. We think they read something into what we're doing that may not exist. Okay, this band is this, this it's an R, this band is an R&B band. Oh, Chicago, now we see what they are. They're a ballad band. This is what you dream about, you know? It doesn't always come in the form you want it to, but we'd already had a ton of success with all different styles of music. We were able to pretty much do as we wanted. The process was a little bifurcated. We used the band, but if you listen to If You Leave Me Now, it's just Bobby's on a road, and then Danny's playing the drums, and everything else, Peter and I did. Those of us who kind of were all about being in a rock band were kind of looking at each other sideways, saying, you know, what, the, what is this, you know? Why are we doing this? Those songs were not Chicago songs. Those songs were Peter's songs. I think that the person who was most affected by it was probably Terry Kath, because he did not want to go there. He did not want to go to, to ballad land. I know the height of his frustration occurred after we recorded Chicago 7, and uh, we went out on the road and we, we tried to play that album live. Without playing the other hits. Without playing the other hits. Right. It, it was great, but the audiences really didn't, they weren't buying it. And I, I smoked a joint and I called Terry and said, Terry, you know what, man? I think when we go out on the road next, we should play every fucking hit we have. Just play every fucking hit and forget about, you know, trying to do the jazz stuff. And he said, Oh man, he says, you're a fucking hypocrite. <laughs> fucking hung it up. So that's that's really where he was. He wanted to stretch out. Because forward, that's yeah. you know, that's where that's that's where we started. That's who we that's who we were. When you get caught up in success and everything, I mean you're so preoccupied by the enormity of a career when it takes off like it did for us that you don't give enough thought to, well, what about the business of this? As far as the business, I really kept an eye on the business a lot more. Things were kind of inequitable. First thing that kind of really resonated with me is here I was living in a thousand square foot rental house in uh, Studio City and, and Jimmy's up on a ranch. And, 3,000 acre ranch. Danny was always trying to tell us that, you know, we need to take a look at the contracts. We need to do this. Let's look at the contracts. We better start looking at the contracts. Relax. Let them do that stuff. We'll do ours. Finally got the band to listen and, and we had the books audited and lo and behold, I mean, the difference, the difference in money was staggering. He was taking 100% of the publishing. Millions of dollars had been going to the wrong place. Millions of dollars. It wasn't like anything was being stolen because we signed these terrible contracts in the very beginning of our careers with, with, with Jimmy. I understood why he developed the company that way. 
and it was basically for everybody's protection. But he was a little smarter than everybody else. Jimmy knew things about the business that we didn't know. And you would have thought that he would hip us to that. But he didn't really. We took it to task and, and re renegotiated. And he had 51% uh, by himself of our entire career. And we had 49% we had split seven ways. So there's quite a difference, especially after Uncle Sam comes in and grabs half. I think we'd gone as far as we were going to be able to go with him, but I just think the time was up with, with that relationship and we had to move on. I never took a penny from anybody, and I don't think he could have found a team that was any more honest than the team that he had built. And in my opinion, he destroyed it. When we left Gursio, it was it was a very very difficult transition. There's a lot of guys in the band. There was enough safety in numbers, if you will, in terms of being productive and having the ability to perform and record and write. Did you see that just broke up after a couple hits? That strain is just the prices that you pay. Through the years, we kept building stage sets. We came up with the street scene, and we had the brilliant idea to put a phone booth on the stage. That was called the Snortatorium. <laughs> you went into the booth, no one could see you from the audience. You would just disappear. But we had cocaine inside of it, and we would go in and take a hit of cocaine. You know, he, people would go in there and snort. That's completely insane. It's getting your heart going like a Maserati coming around the curve. You just lay into it and hit that turn like you're going to... Oh, I got it and you could die, just like that. I was just coming home from a Laker game, and I got a phone call from our manager. He he did one of those, are you sitting down things? And uh, he said, Terry's dead. <laughs> Obviously, still hits me. Holy shit. 25 days into the new year, and the front line of the rock and roll ranks have been depleted once again. The lead singer of Chicago, Terry Kath, is dead. What? I, I didn't believe what I heard. I just, I almost, I got up and I almost fell to my knees. And the phone was ringing. And I don't know why, but I, I got the word that he had passed away. And that was uh, one of the worst days of my life. Terry was uh, uh, getting ready to do a solo record. Had been rehearsing at the house of... Uh, uh, one of the fellas in our crew. He was at Don Johnson's house, our keyboard tech. He did drugs with Terry and he partied with Terry a lot. Apparently he had been cleaning his gun and this was a little automatic pistol. Donnie Johnson kind of squawked at him about, hey man, you know, it's the middle of the night, you haven't slept, don't clean your guns, don't mess around with your guns, just go to bed. And Terry said, hey look, man, you know, I know what I'm doing, and apparently Terry took the clip out of the gun, showed him that there was nothing in the clip, but apparently there was a still a round chamber. Terry was just fooling with the gun, and uh, um, 
instantly and uh, it was really really hard news I didn't believe it and uh, I believed it when I went to the wake and he was laid out in the casket and the, th the thing that really hit me is when I touched his The shell, because <laughs> that's that's what it is. That's what these are. It's a shell. When the humanity leaves, the soul leaves. It is a, a hollow body. This is the car we drive around in on this plane. In uh, throughout this lifetime, this is not our essence. Our soul, our spiritual self, is our essence. And when this body dies. That leaves. We didn't do enough. We should have intervened. Because that's what friends do, real friends do for one another. I think at the time, we didn't know how to handle that. How do you tell somebody not to do something that you might be doing? I think I'd sort of lost my way in every aspect of my life. The thing about Terry Kath is that the ferocious force and drive of his playing is what, is what informed this band. And when he was gone, it changed forever. I still had dreams that I was sitting on my front steps at the house that I was raised in in Elmwood Park, and Terry came walking down the street like nothing had ever happened. There's Terry. He said, oh, yeah, it was an FBI thing. I had to, I had to go away and hide out, but I'm back. Let's, you know, let's go on. And, you know, I was going, Terry, Jesus Christ, we replaced you already. It seems like really a small period of time, like a week or two weeks, if that long, that we, that we came to the realization that Terry's gone, but he would want us to keep going. We're all alive, we're still viable, we still love doing it, let's go. And we decided that we were gonna, we were gonna continue any way we could. People didn't want us to stop because they wanted to see what we had to offer musically. We spent more money on blow and mansions and, and on Hot Streets album than we did on recording. I was already spinning out of control before Terry's death, so there was a lot of things kind of floating around that were bothering me, and I had no idea how to deal with it. We definitely had the big dip, and it was a smack in the face that, hey, things aren't happening for you right now. Bad, bad, black cats are bad luck. It's about this, this guy that's got really bad luck. The black cats, there's always a black cat in the scene. Something bad is gonna happen to this guy, you know, he's cursed. It's funny. Looking back on Jimi Hendrix, and he just basically said, you know, it's just all the travel, the business, and it's 
spitting out my hits and he looked at me and he said, and you're going to have it worse. And I thought, yeah, I hope we do. Be careful what you wish for. You might get it. <laughs> for some reason with drugs, you tell yourself that it's not that bad. I'm not as bad as other people. I just remembered being in a room by myself, snorting cocaine. And it never being enough. And I remember taking a snort and timing to see how fast my heart was going. That's insane. Because I could have snuffed myself out at any moment. But because I haven't, I've gotten to grow. I've gotten to enjoy life more. Um, you know, hopefully become the person I've always wanted to be. During the 70s, they sold over 60 million records with an unbroken string of hits like, uh, does anyone know what time it is? Saturday in the park. Uh, and if you leave me now, they're continuing that sex. Sex. They're continuing that <laughs> success. <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to, to know who to talk to because they're all stars of the band, right? Molehill has never become mountains. It's a democratic organization. There's no front man, and everybody uh, has an equal say so. Walter Perizader, <laughs> Lee Lockney, Peter Cetera, Bobby Lamb, Danny Serafin on drums, Chris Pinnock on guitar. My first day of rehearsing with them, I had to go down and hide in the pool house because nobody had told Donnie that he was out of the band. We had auditioned unbeknownst to Donnie. Donnie Degas was late for rehearsal. We finally got a hold of him. What? Bullshit. What do you mean? Two words, buddy. You're fired. I thought that you thought... You love the shoes, you bought the shoes because you loved them, but they don't feel comfortable. Next, you gotta get a different pair of shoes that don't put blisters on your feet. My playing just happened to, rhythmically wise, uh, happened to be a lot like Terry's. Chris Pittick would, had the in, some of the inside guitar stuff because Terry was just a great rhythm guitar player outside of a great soloist and, and great singer. There was no leader, per se, in this band, but in terms of a driving force, replacing Terry Cat was no easy task. But he was, you know, I mean, there's no touching Terry Cat. I knew that. Everybody else should know that. You know, so they have to get, they would have to get used to someone else's playing. I do think that the trends in, in music and tastes and generational uh, shift uh, was occurring uh, just in the culture anyway. And to, for any rock band to survive all of that, to withstand all of those, those effects, is nearly impossible. People make records and you expect to hear what's on the record. Now, you know, when people come to see us, they want to hear what put us on the map. There's just something, I was always thankful about the hits, and it never bothered, it bothered me to play them. There was a time when Make Me Smile the Ballet, we hated to do it. I think a lot of artists take this attitude, and we've done it too over the course of our career. Oh, I don't want to do that song anymore. And you know, well, that's what the people come to hear. Those songs put us on the map too. I mean, those that's songs right. uh, put the pool in my backyard. I can't forget those songs, <laughs> you know? Thank you, Jesus. Children play in a park.
trotted us off the label. And so he was, we left the CBS building with our tails between our legs, and then we flew home back to LA. And I remember our plane got struck by lightning. The plane was struck by yeah, lightning. Struck by lightning a couple times, and then was it an omen of some? Well, that's what I thought. I thought of it as an omen, thinking about well, something bad is coming upon us. And you know, they bought us off the label. You know, they gave us a couple million dollars to leave the label. So we decided to just take, you know, take some money and and go on and find a producer and try to do do the best album we could possibly do. At that point, we were dysfunctional. We weren't writing great songs anymore, and it was just a, the band had gone really stale. Look, any time a band's been made, you know, as many records as they had made at Columbia, um, you know, it can go stale. Irving Azoff, he had a, a label called Full Moon. It was a part, it was a, a subsidiary of Warner Brothers. And I had moved my record label out of CBS at about the same time that Chicago became free. Irving was, you know, you know, known to be this really great manager, you know, who fought for his artists. And I think I went to them and said, I'll give you the best of both worlds. I'll give you Warner's and I'll give you my undivided attention as a label head. Even in those days, the two respected labels were Columbia and Warner's. So, you know, you wanted to be on one of those two. You know, so when I was starting the label, I said, I'm going to sign Chicago. Well, why do you want to sign Chicago? You know, because their sales had, had dwindled. Um, I always believed. I stood in the center of the room like this, and they were all around me. And they were about to play me the songs that they had written for Chicago 16. Each one was equally as average as the last. And so now, after the 13 songs, they say, well, what do you think of the, the record? And I said, I said, these songs suck. I don't want any trouble. David Foster uh, was a very sought after, exciting young writer producer. Uh, who was really at the top of his game. I don't know what Jimmy Gersio's contribution was to those early albums, but I suspect that that sound that they had, he just had to harness the sound and just, like, hang on for dear life. I don't think he was hands-on the way I was, you know, getting there and playing and arranging and writing. But the very first day of the very first session, I pressed the talk pad and I go, ah, uh, Peter, you know, when you get to the bridge, uh, you played a wrong note there. It's an F, not an E, or whatever. Or he took me to the vocal booth where there was nobody in there. And he said, you know, I don't want you to ever out me in front of the band. And furthermore, I don't even want to play bass anymore. You're going to play the bass. Peter was unhappy in the group. And then the double whammy was that we just clicked and it was just fortunate and unfortunate all at the same time, but we came a power couple within the group. Hard to Say I'm Sorry, which was the big first hit, emerges uh, from a, a, a movie soundtrack called Summer Lovers, everything fell in place. We all went to the premiere. Peter and I are sitting next to each other. We've written the song, he's singing it. We're so excited. The end title comes on, starts out, you can hear it really nice. We're getting excited, like this is our moment, man. And it's just filling the speakers. Way in the background of the movie is a motorcycle. It's getting louder and louder, and the song is getting softer and softer, and like, it's like, Dude, are you kidding? You think the sound of a motorcycle is more important than this beautiful song we've written? We were really bummed. But it went to number one. Bang! Everybody needs a little time away. I've heard a say from each other. Peter started to feel. You know, invincible. He started to feel empowerment. Peter had really shaped up. You know, he really got physically in shape. He was really focused. He was really kind of like a new man. It's hard for me to say I'm sorry. No one, there was never any one face in the band, but it became all about Peter. After all the who you've been through. First, the focus did change, and there were videos. When we went in to record videos, the director would say, so who's the leader? What do you mean? There is no leader. And, you know, you shoot all of us. Well, I can't do that. There's too many guys. There'd be no focus. So guess what? They focus on the lead singer, and Peter Cetera became the star. Couldn't stand 
just for the day from nobody. So all of a sudden we have this new guy who's stepping to the front. And frankly, it's completely different than anything Chicago was doing. Far away from the one that I know. At that particular point in time, adding a new approach, you know, with a, a new enthusiasm was fortuitous timing. We were desperate for a hit record. Okay, if that's what you think, we're good with that. If that'll put us on the radio, okay. David would start dictating lines to us, because he wrote the song with Peter. He did a great job, and he did a wonderful job on those records, you know? I know I'm great. You can't have 16 Grammys and not be great. <laughs> Naturally, he had his crew. That's who he was gonna use, but it didn't do some of us any good because he wouldn't use us on the records. And because Peter was part of the writing team, he had more of a say in what was gonna go on there. The songs that we had written, eh, not so much. I had submitted a few songs to David Foster and they weren't really even songs, they were just sort of song ideas and and I think maybe one of them got saved uh, and, and, and made into a song, that was Getaway. And I didn't get any writing credit on that. And the horns is the melody of Getaway. Oh, he's just an arranger. most absent when I was making those three records was Bobby Lamb, Robert Lamb. I was being very self-destructive, and I just wasn't showing up. You know, I just was not. He was really different than pretty much anybody. He was very quiet, and you, you, know, you never really knew what he was thinking. Well, you know, I, my ego was crushed. You know, in my mind, I was writing the really good songs. He said, well, to me, man, Chicago is Peter Cetera's voice and the three horns. I was like a young rattlesnake, all the venom all at once. I wanted to make a great record and nobody's gonna get in my way and it's gonna be my way and, you know, they, they really resented that. I mean, I, I totally respect it and admire it and I get it, I get what it is. They just sound weird to me. It's a whole other Chicago. It wasn't Chicago anymore. Just when they were a jamming band, you know, he took them and focused everything. You know, and created his arrangements, created his band. Hi, I'm Tammy, and I'm listening to one of Chicago's very popular songs called Hard to Say I'm Sorry. The first time I heard Chicago was when I was 13, but Chicago's been a very popular group since I was five years old. Uh, what makes your group so together? You seem to have such a family oriented group. We actually grew up together in this business. I mean, from being kids, you know, to, to this to the point where it, where we are right now. We've and we've experienced all of the success and 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 uh, the good things and a lot of hardships, and we've struggled through all of them together. And uh, we like each other. I left and went to uh, run Universal in 1983. To my recollection, they continued to record with Warners for many, many years, from the, the Peter Chevarelli uh, side of things. You know, it's easy to take care of Jimmy Buffett or Stevie Nicks or so. You talk to one person. With Chicago, it's a kind of a committee. I always used to say that they used to have a meeting about having a meeting. Some of the problems was we'd have band meetings. Everything was done dem democratically. Peter showed up at the meeting and made ultimatums. Peter wanted a double share and... We knew that he did not want to go on the road. I like my own bus. You know, I want, uh, you know, I want more. We said, okay, well, you know, we'll give you more control. You want that, that's gonna do something. I'd have to say that Peter, to be very honest, was not a fan of the horns. You 
know, Peter felt that there didn't need to be brass on every single song, and I, I happen to agree. I just can't say that they were the integral part of the, what the music was up to that point. Horn players would come in, you know, and they'd hear the vocals, and they'd literally walk over to the board, and they go, turn those vocals down, and, like, they just grab the faders, and, and there'd be no vocals. And then we'd put it back, and then Peter would come in and go, turn those horns down. To concentrate on the vocals, he would actually stop playing the bass. There, there would be no bottom. So that's when I started playing the more bass. I picked up a guitar, Jimmy played keyboards, and we just wanted to be part of the, of the songs. It came to a point that we thought, geez, maybe, we, maybe it's not gonna be a horn band anymore. Peter and David had a string of big hits. They had a, a relationship that worked. My records were good. I mean, I, I was like hitting my stride as a writer and as a producer and as a player. And I begged them, I said, guys, this is a hit. I promise you, this is a hit record. You've got to cut this song. No, we're not interested. We don't like it. We don't want to do it. We didn't write it. We don't want to do it. To appease them, I used all three of them to get them at least interested to do the demo. We were very successful, and then we went downhill, and then I kind of brought us back up again, and, uh, and now it was, uh, wow. How long before you knew you'd made the right choice? When Peter left, it gave them the opportunity to kind of, you know, reform the way they want to. So, you know, they had the manager call up and say, I think I can almost quote his words, we're not sure how the band's going to be structured next year. <laughs> so, you know, what I mean to me, that says you're fired. I was just looking at it as, let me just play and sing these songs like a, a great Top 40 gig. We'd had success with Foster, but we needed to, obviously, we had Peter was gone now, so we needed a departure. You know, it was kind of like a team losing a good player, but Robert and Lee and Walt and Jimmy, they just picked right up uh, and just, you know, moved forward. It's not gonna stay the same. It's gotta, it's gotta be different. It's gotta go somewhere. And we did all the power ballads. We got shit for doing the power ballads too. This, you know, they've sold out. They don't, they, you know, they don't take chances anymore. I don't care what they think. You're redoing one of the classic songs, and that's like, you know, why put me in that position? Again, I was just going, awesome. I don't hide the fact that I tried to get him to sing like Peter on the record. There were and are a lot of tenor voices in rock, and none of them sound like Cetera. In my mind, I'm the one that brought Jason into the band. Now, you're going to get, like, Ten different perspectives about who called him and who put him in the band. Foster wanted him out of the band. He didn't like his voice at all. And I fought with David. And I fought for, for Jason. I said, no, you give him a chance. I absolutely, 100% never wanted Jason out of the band. I wanted him in the band. And in my recollection, he was my pick. And I brought him to the guys. That's what I recall. Is that solid enough? I can't believe that Danny would say that I didn't want Jason in the band. I mean, it's just, it's just ludicrous. Coming into something that had been together for so long with this is a family, this is awesome, this is us and everything, but I was with a group full of guys who were mentors that had been through a lot and I'm looking at that going, this is what they did to come out the other end of it, this is what I'm doing and it's cyclical. You just do your best work and just don't self-destruct and it all comes back around. The road is narrowing. If you just stay and survive, there aren't really going to be many left.
I was working with David Foster at a time when David, for whatever reason, felt he wasn't getting what he wanted from Danny. My friend Hawk Walensky calls me and he said, hey, what the fuck is David, is Jeff Picaro playing on Chicago record? I went, what? David Foster wanted to have somebody who could play better with a click because it was the era of the click. He had kind of lost his confidence and, and I had this sound that I wanted that he couldn't get. I don't know. I, all I know is that he did that behind Danny's back and Danny got very, very upset about it. In fact, he, he threatened him. The manager called me and said, you better get out of there right now. I said, why? Because Danny Serafin just found out and he's coming down to the studio and he has a gun. First of all, I wanted to kill him. I'm, you know, almost dead. I said, what the fuck is what's going on? And they said, well, we wanted to try out Simmons. They had the electronic drums, and Jeff had a set, so we wanted to hear him. I think it was, I think it was kind of, I, I think it was bullshit. When technology started improving, or at least growing, or inventing new stuff, musicians had to learn how to use them. All of a sudden, being thrown on a click, and I could see him talking about me in the control room, and I could feel everybody talking about me, and. It was, I could feel the undercurrent of doubt. Oh, it just fucked me up. The function of a drummer is to actually keep time. Nothing else. Danny is a drummer. I would consider him a lead drummer, not a rhythm drummer. He plays solos. Right. Constantly. Through all songs. In my estimation. I really don't want to f have to figure out where one is. And, and that's, you know, my, the musician talking. Changing the time without everybody else knowing where it's gonna go, the rest of the guys in the band shouldn't have to figure that out. Danny's lack of accurate drumming and accurate timekeeping was, was really a detriment to the band and live performance. We went to England finally again. Uh, we hadn't had a career in England for a long time because Terry uh, insulted the country on the world tour in 77. And here we are in London. I, you know, I was my, I took my wife with me. She'd never been to Europe. She got him out of the sack at like seven in the morning. They rented a car. Danny's driving himself. We went sightseeing. Seeing castles and whatnot. I should have rested, so I was jet lagged. Here it is 12 hours later. We're leaving for a show. And this man, I played, we played a show and I, I really did play horribly. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was terrible. After the show, we had a meeting. Hey, Danny, you gotta stop looking at castles. Dude, come on, what's going on here, man? You lost it here. In the 70s, he really broke a lot of new ground. When he was really good, he was very good. In my view, he spent too much time focusing on things other than music and you know, really sort of being on top of it. His mentality was Buddy Rich, Mick Fleetwood, that he should control the band. And I think it kind of wore thin after a while. There's probably some truth to that. We had good management at that point. I really didn't need to be the drummer manager anymore, leading the band out of the darkness, so to speak. When we're playing, we're not worrying about business. That's a separate thing that has its compartment. I really just think business really became more important than playing. You don't do business like just before the show or during the show or, you know, worrying about the deal. You play the fucking song. It shows he, he started having these mixing boards next to his drums. And he'd be playing, and while he was playing, he was mixing. It takes two hands and two legs to play the drums. If you take one of them off, you start missing stuff. Dude, what are you doing? That was when the founding members got together with Danny and asked him to take some time and get it, get it together. You know, I mean, there was truth to, there was truth to, to all of that to a certain degree. I could kind of see it, and I thought, if these guys are all saying it, they must be right. That's a viewpoint and a perspective by the collective group, and it's a message. I said, okay, I'll go back and I'll, I'll woodshed and, you know, have a 
long meeting with myself about my playing and, and work on it, and work on it with a click and work on this and that. And so I went and, and I, I got with a teacher, woodshedded like crazy for six weeks. And When Danny came back from sort of woodshedding and us having to work with another drummer, there was really no change. And when we tried to make him aware of it, he didn't agree. So one thing led to another and he ended up being out rather than in. And as much as I kind of knew it was coming, it was a, it just knocked me to my knees. And you know, it was a, you know, I lived and eat and drank and pissed, bled, cried, lived, died that bad, you know. You know, I'm just speculating, but I think that Danny felt that you know, he was a founding member of the band and we were going to have to take him, you know, regardless of how he felt he was playing. Uh, I, I just felt that if he was going to stay in the band, it would tear the band apart. So he had to go. I think the loss of friendship was probably what, I, what hurt me more than anything. Because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I went from having seven, six or seven other, like, brothers to nothing. We would have never gotten rid of anybody. That's not the way it works. The Beatles didn't get rid of anybody. You know, we, it, how could it be the Beatles if somebody leaves? Come on. That's the last thing we wanted to do, but it became impossible to work and function properly as a band. Those six guys in that room, that, that stayed together and was special for such a long time, longer than the shelf lives of all the one-hit wonders and, and somewhere in between that that glitch happened. And I'm really sorry for it. People are always going to know me for, as, as a drummer of Chicago. I mean, it's even, it's ironic. I mean, they still bill me as the Chicago's Danny Seraphin. Once Danny was gone and Tris came in, I think all of us thought, hey, we better, we better all, you know, shape up. They really made me feel at home. They also said, you don't have to do what Danny did. It sort of sounds like, with all due respect to Danny, like he's always been there. Since Tris has joined the band, I talked about never having to worry about where one is. I've never had to worry about where one is. No matter what the time period, the songwriting has just been stellar through five decades, right? What's the line about a writer writes always? You know, I think a musician plays, performs always. And I think that's what we do. That's what this band is about. We'll be in there somewhere in the index under C, <laughs> Chicago. Hopefully. <laughs> Those guys, man, all of them, just have this uncanny ability and do reinvent themselves and what they hear, what their, or their muse tells them or whatever, you know? You know, we're not on magazine covers, you know, we're not the flavor of the month. It's the tortoise and the hare. The hare is gonna win the race. Oh man, wow. And in the fable, the tortoise wins the race. Because the tortoise is focused only on the task at hand, which is the music. We were going to cut our auditions off one day early, and I said, I really believe it's worth a listen to stick around and hear this one guy. He was playing the rhythm things that Terry had. He had that feel. Yeah, he goes, you were the only guy that went... Anybody close enough to Terry? You're hired, man. ethic in the band is, I would think, incredible. We'll out-practice anybody. Chicago feels like a band to me. One unit working together, you know, like much like a team. I think everyone genuinely cares about each other. We spend more time with each other than we do with anybody else. I think that's just a thing that's kind of grown uh, over the years. 
brain works perhaps more efficiently with facts, if, with, with bullet points. Obviously, it's a very different experience to have lived through history. To me, it's been all, one very long sweep. I couldn't foresee anything as far as anybody leaving with anybody who's come and gone in this band. It's funny because people will find what their cumulative value is. Bill Champlin. Oh, uh, well, the only reason people come here to see the band is because of me. Oh, really? Hmm, okay. Bye. Next. And then the band grew, and styles changed. At a certain point, if you've played on some hit records, people have heard you. And if you've played well or played something interesting, they remember you. Then they call you. One of the most amazing singers I know, great keyboard player, Lou Pardini. Even Lou became a natural part of what we've always been. I think it was a good fit for myself and for the band. I'm taking it at a, at a, at a time where I've had a lot of experience under my belt. Being creative, making new music, going out, doing better shows. I think we've put together a show that's the best one we've ever had. February 15th, 2014 will be the beginning of the 48th year. Nobody has had successful years consecutively for 47 years. Nobody. 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 could outlast businesses, banks, venues. You know, they build venues, we go play them. They tear the venue down, we go play them new after they build it. I, th I think the longest period that we weren't on the road was about three months. It, at, the, at the very most, it would have been six. We are continuing with our success, and it's at this level. To this day, I'm embarrassed to say I'm a, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, although I've just been back there a couple of years. I'm embarrassed to say that they're not. I think it's an injustice. I think that Chicago very strongly deserves uh, to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You don't get to the Hall of Fame maybe until you're gone. Then they're never getting in because they're never going away. We've always been kind of an afterthought. As far as the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, by any criteria, they belong in there. Longevity, number of hits, number of shows, number of records sold. If it comes, it'll come. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has announced its 2016 inductees. Chief Director Steve Miller, Deep Purple, NWA, and Chicago will be added to the Hall of Fame on April 8, 2016. The perception of being in and actually being in is quite different. All of a sudden, we have the keys to the club. Yeah! We figured it was a matter of time. We're certainly uh, qualified. This is an awesome historical moment for Chicago. It's surreal. Being included with so many other people is just terrific. Congratulations. Thank you for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. Long overdue. Good uh, to see you. you man. The question that looms is, obviously Chicago is going to perform at the induction, and the question is, are you going to join them? Well, I, uh, you know what? I am going to reserve any comment um, on that until tomorrow on my website. Sotero wasn't really with us in the initial band that was in the 60s. For him not to have participated in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction is his choice and no one else's. He's missing something that will never come back again. It would have been nice if everybody could have been here, including Terry. As you say, it's been a long, long career. Things happen when they happen for a reason. Thank you very much. Hello. In 1967, a group of musicians came together and they were weaving their city's diverse musical influences into one bold, beautiful sound. It is my honor to finally induct Terry Kapp, P. 
Peter Zatera, Danny Serafine, Walter Perizader, Lee Lockmain, James Pankow, and Robert Lamb, Chicago, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's a milestone. Thank you for finally inviting us into your house. For me, when you say who the greatest American bands, you're going to say the Eagles, the Beach Boys, Chicago. This band started on February 15, 1967, when we played for the first time in my basement. <laughs> we never thought we'd be standing up here at this time. People dancing, people laughing, a man selling ice cream. They don't deserve to be in the Rock Hall of Fame. They're finally in the Hall of Fame. This is not one of a hundred shows. This is one of the most special shows of their careers. Life has many ups and downs, but I've been blessed with three things that have never failed me. Music, my trumpet, and uh, the guys in this band. Walt, Danny, Lee, James, Terry. Whenever I perform Saturday in the Park, it was a line that I sing about a, a man playing guitar. And I always give a, a quick look up to the heavens to say hi. And I'm still working through losing Terry. My earliest recollections were they were playing, and in those days, they used to have to play six sets. They always, you know, worked hard, and like I say, uh, it's kind of ironic because nothing's changed. That was basically how they've started, and they've continued on. They love to play. They love to perform. I'd like to thank our manager, Peter Chivarelli, who's believed in us for well over 30 years. And I'm biased because I'm from the neighborhood in Chicago, 12th and Pulaski. And I have to say, you're, no, you're a great friend. and You have a heart of gold. He has been our offense and defense. He's uh, somehow found a way to keep us working for almost 50 years. We love you, Peter. He's like an energizer bunny. He never needs batteries, though. He just keeps going and going and going. You know, a lot of people bring up, they've been around for a long time. What's their secret? Even with the additions that had to be brought in due to departure or death, I think they're all guys that worked in harmony, not only good players, but good players who were easy to coexist with. And lastly, to the fans out there for making it happen for us day after day and year after year. We're not going anywhere, and you ain't seen nothing yet. Until the last couple of years, I haven't really ever thought about it would be nice to just uh, sit. Or it would, it would be nice to not have to be somewhere in some lobby at 6.30, getting ready, getting on a bus and going to a gig. It'd be nice to not have to play. Uh, and, you know, having said all that, uh, anybody who stops doing anything that they've done their entire life will eventually miss it. Once we get off tour, you know, I don't know what our relationship will be because we don't see each other. You don't know what it's going to be like, you know, and it's, it's a little scary. It's something I've done since I'm nine years old, and that will never go away. Logically, I don't expect, you know, if... You know, once it's over, um, I, I don't expect we would spend much time together. We've spent enough time together to last a lifetime. I will never stop thinking of my brothers as my brothers. We're closer than we are to our, some of our families. You know, we have separate families now. We are still our, you know, the brothers. And... Uh, I 
I don't know. I feel uh, the impetus of of running out of time that I'm finding to be very inspiring. I feel like I'm running out of time, and I better get I better get down. Yeah. Yeah, mortality is a reality. Well, we've been asked how long it could go for quite a long time, and yeah, oh you yeah, know, it it doesn't have to stop. But I don't want to fuck around. No, we're not fucking around. We ain't fucking around. <laughs> if we're fucking around, we're hitting ourselves. <laughs> Robert one time said he wants to be like Picasso, and Picasso fell over dead working on a sculpture at 96, and he said, I want to be like Picasso and fall over dead on stage. And Lee said, yeah, we'll all fall over dead together. <laughs> we know it's hard for you to see. at CA with a lot of agents. This is a band that loves to work, and the more you play, the better you become, and they just become the well oiled machine, and it's just instinctful now. The core and the heart of Chicago, they're not done. And the performance they gave at the Grammys was nothing short of terrific. We're really blessed to have them. They're one of the handful of most important bands in the history of music since the dawn of the rock and roll era. They basically influenced everything I do as far as writing you know, and performing as well. They were truly a great band in, in the true sense of the word. I opened up the second album and look at each individual guys while I was listening to the song. He's playing drums and he is the singer on this song. So I used to make like my images, you know. I got to be about a junior in high school and um, a little cliche-ish, but it was really from the very beginning that I started to to follow them. I remember when the second album came out, their messages were not just music. It wasn't just a rock and roll band with horns. They're, they're a rock and roll band. And someone will say, well, but they have horns. Yeah. Jason's been here for, what, close to 30 years now, 25 years for Tris, almost 20 for me. A lot of people think that all it takes to be successful in the industry is to be a great player. But we're all trying to support each other and put out the best product, if you will. Hot solo. The more that we do these songs, the more it becomes a part of me, and the more I become a part of it. This little club that we're in is a moment right now that's happening, and if we're not paying attention to it, it's going to go by, and then people look back and just go, wow, the good old days. Well, these are the good old days. I've been around on this planet almost as long as the band has. So I've actually, you know, my entire life has been growing up with this band. As a kid in the 70s, they were kids as a rock band. In the 80s, they found that, you know, that success again, I'm graduating high school. Then, you know, they disappear a little bit. I'm confused in my life. As cliche as it sounds, Chicago literally is the soundtrack to my life. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Music at the best of times. You know, when you no longer exist, when you just watch yourself play this incredible stuff that you've never played before, and the realization that all we have is, to, is this moment right now. Yeah. 